we got to preach for a long time, and it was nice to have that hailer out there and to use that. Um, and they kept saying, we can't hear you, though they were mad at what we were saying. So I knew they... Are you, are you too... What, what are you doing over there, anyway? Over here, that's okay. Everybody will be able to hear me, right, Luke? They'll hear me. Luke always turns me down anyway. I tend to yell sometimes, so we will. You didn't hear that fuzzy. You don't have an ear for fuzz. That's why it's. That's Dave's professional seat right there, and he sits there and he hears all of it. It is, really. Anyway, so um, next week, we're going to have church at my house in Owatonna there. At, and the reason why is we're going to have a baptism, a couple baptisms. Uh, Marv and uh, Margaret are going to be baptized. And I, I bought a pool. So, no, I don't really want to go swim in that bad, but my kids do. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, but I bought a pool to baptize in in case it's necessary. And we are going to, uh, for baptisms, now if we need it during the winter time and different times like that, we can use it if we have to. It's actually cheaper than, than the one that we're going to try to make. Brother Andrew and I, we're going to try to buy one that had a baptistry that was like that. But um, I got some cushions that have gaskets. Yeah, just throw them out there in the... The, you got hit right there. That You should have hit him harder. You should have thumped him. A good one there. He needed it. Yeah, well, we'll try to make it clean. But anyway, so we'll have church out there uh, next week, and, and then we'll baptize uh, Brother Marv and Margaret. And uh, praise the Lord. Amen. That's a, that's a, a blessing. And... Um, I think that uh, I don't want to wait any longer. You know, here's what I did. Let me tell you. I, I think it was, somebody say something. Oh, no, I, I thought. Oh, oh.
I'm going to deal with something I told you I was going to deal with here this week. And some of you may not understand this. Um, you may not have ever experienced anything like this yet in your Christian life. Had someone preached this to me uh, five years ago, it wouldn't really me meant a whole lot to me in that sense because of the place that I was at it five years ago. Uh, now, uh, I, I understand it pretty pretty well. I mean, I understand it pretty good now because of what I've been through, what the Lord has brought me through and experience and everything. And Joshua in this chapter, he, he deals with this thing. And, and it's kind of, you know, I, we're going to kind of go from this, uh, this, uh, text here in Joshua chapter seven, uh, verse number seven and a few other verses. And then we're going to kind of spin off on the concept of what's happening here with Joshua and liken it to the Christian life. And we're only going to get through half of that today. The other half will be next week, I believe. The remedies and solutions to that will be next week. But I think it's important um, to understand this, and I think it applies to a few different situations. Many of you, it applies to your present situation now of things that you're going through or that you will go through in the future or that you have gone through in the past. But it applies to, it can apply to desertion, spiritual desertion, which some of you may not understand what that means, but I'll explain that, or spiritual depression, you could call it, okay, uh, which is a real thing, by the way. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, it, it can apply to someone going through depression. The, the answers are the same. Sometimes the symptoms are the same. But it's finding the understanding of what's going on in our lives and our hearts, what, what's happening to us, and uh, being able to, to better apply the scriptures to our present situation that we're in. See, this, is, this book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 7, it applies to God wrote his word. It's an eternal word, okay? So in other words... Uh, his word is relevant and it applies to your situation today, just like it did to Joshua's situation there, just like it will to well, long after we're gone and we go to be with the Lord, it'll apply to that generation that comes. God, there will never be a time that God's word is not relevant, necessary, and needed for his people. Do you understand that? There never will be a time that, that that's the case. You'll never outgrow God's word. You'll never be like that one pastor uh, told Dave when he said, uh, I feel like I've preached everything out of the Bible that I can to people. So now I'm just going to preach out of my heart. That's a dangerous thing to say. Right? Right? <laughs> it's a very dangerous thing to say, and I would say that's not true because every time I go through the Bible during my devotions and I go back through all the way through the Old Testament all the way, and I'm going back through, I'm always, like right now I've been in Mark, and that's one of the reasons why I'm preaching uh, out of the book of Mark to you this, this afternoon is because God gave it to me, and I was like, I, sometimes I think about this, and I think about my messages, and I think, you know what, I really don't want to do this on, on the broadcast that I do. I would like to do this for the church. Because I think the church needs this. I think this is very necessary for our church to listen to as a body. And then, you know, we, we'll put it online. But there are times that I see things like that and, uh, and that I think that, man, this would really be profitable right now. So Joshua chapter 7 and verse number 7. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? The Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have, they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and disassembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Father in heaven, Lord, we pray that you be with us now. Help us as we go through the scriptures. Help us to be able to understand them, apply them to our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray and ask it. Amen. 
All right, so we come to Joshua and his mighty battle after Jericho that we discussed last week, those great contrasts that were there uh, of God being with us, those suffering great loss at times. Sometimes we feel as if God is not with us if we suffer things, but that's not necessarily the truth. Obviously, he is still with us in, in the sense of never leaving us nor forsaking us. But I think it's a good time to deal with something that the Bible talks about, that it illustrates over and over again, that has been termed desertion or spiritual desertion in the Christian life. Some things may befall you in this Christian life that you are not able to explain or to understand fully. There will be times in your Christian life where you will just kind of scratch your head and say, what in the world is happening? What's going on with me? What's happening to me spiritually? What I, I feel like I'm in this place of, of turmoil and I don't understand what's happening to me. There are times like that in the Christian life. The more you're with Christ, the more you follow Christ. As a pastor, I can say that I've been through those situations and many things have befallen me in the service of the king that I did not understand. I could not rightly explain. I could not understand. Many times I didn't even speak of them or talk of them because I could not understand them. I had to go to the Lord with them and just let God teach me. And he did teach me. But spiritual desertion can be found in the scriptures. It's in it, in the text that we see and in other, others throughout the Bible. I even wonder if many pastors have been through that but they have no understanding of what's happening to them and they just quit the ministry and they walk away. They can't explain what's going on in their heart. They can't explain. I remember when, when I was, I think it was either before I was saved or right, maybe it was right after I was saved. There was this pastor in this little town. We were at this meeting uh, at the church that I got saved in. We, we went to a meeting at another church. And I, I remember when we were at that meeting, this pastor, I remember him crying and saying, he said that, that, you know, something had to happen in his heart at that meeting. Otherwise he wasn't going to be able to keep going. And the Lord had done something for him and, 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 you know, and helped him. He was discouraged. He was distraught. He was depressed. And, uh, and he just needed something from God. I didn't understand that at that time because I was, I was young and riding high on, on being newly saved out of the world and, and, and newly married and walking with the Lord and excited about, about the ministry and just living on that youthful zeal that God gives you when you're newly saved to get you through a lot of those things that you, you don't notice a lot of things. And thank God that you don't because you'd be bombarded with it. And you'd probably walk away. But uh, uh, you don't notice a lot of those things. But then la years later, I got to the ministry, went through battles and, and, and got many victories and saw many victories, many, 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 many victories. Uh, people saved and, and joined the church and different things happened and all those things. And then all of a sudden, uh, think God allowed things to happen. And God allowed me to come to a point like that in my, in my ministry and in my life where, you know, I was brought down in that destitution and that desertion and depressions and discouragements. I think there's some pastors that feel like they're totally forsaken. They don't know how to talk to anybody about it. They don't know how to have that conversation. And they've never really studied the scriptures intensely, probably. They've never had good resources Right. Or, you know, I just attribute it to the grace of almighty God that God led me and showed me those things. Amen. You know, God led me to to read after men like Spurgeon and men like A.W. Pink and other men like that young on in my ministry before I was even in the ministry. You say, well, you know, I don't know about reading books. Well, I do. I think it's profitable for you to use your brains. OK, I think it's important uh, to use that. Now, obviously, the Word of God is the most important thing that we ever read, but it's not wrong for you to read after other men, just like it's not wrong for you to hear men preach. Last night, I heard five men preach. It's not wrong for me to hear those five men preach, just like it's not wrong for you to read a book from five different men like that, right? Same concept, same thing. But anyway, uh, a lot of times, pastors, they go through things like that, and they don't have anybody to help them. They don't know what to do, so they get discouraged and they quit. They don't know what's happening to them. They think they've lost their passion. They've lost their drive. They've lost their fire. They don't know how to get it back, and they don't know what happened, and they, they get discouraged. But you know what? That's not just for pastors. That's for you because you can do the same thing. You can become the same way, and then you, you're, you're looking around, and you're like, what's wrong with me? What am I going to do? Oh, no, what, what's, what's happening to me? Yep. Right? 
that can happen to you. Okay? And my heart goes out to men that go through that and women that go through that. I, I understand that trial. I understand that traumatic experience. And you say, well, I've never went through that, and I just think those people are weak. Well, I think that's true. I think they are weak. And I think you're going to be weak sometime. And you know what? The Bible says to comfort the feeble-minded and to support the weak. So guess what? Don't make fun of them and don't mock them because you're not going through that. You think, well, I'm a strong Christian. I'm never going to be like that. No, you're the next candidate for it. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I, I've been amongst the strongest when it comes to things like that and preached the hardest and, and battled like that. And guess what? God showed me the same thing. He brought me down to let me go through some things, to teach me, to make me sensitive so I could help others, so I could actually be a blessing and have compassion for others. Because I'll be honest with you, seven or eight years ago, if you'd have preached this to me, I'd have been like, I don't know, maybe they're just not saved. Maybe they're just not Christians. Maybe that's what's wrong with them. Right? That's what I would have thought. That's what some of you would have thought, too. And maybe some of you think that when you see that, right? Maybe. Right? But you know what? If a man, if he can find his situation in the Bible, he doesn't have to be discouraged. He can be encouraged by that. Right? I can look at my situation in the Bible. I can, by the way, I can see, as a pastor, I can look at your present situation and everything that you're going through right now and the trials that you have. And I can take the scriptures and I can show you your present condition and situation that you're, that you're facing. Not because I'm some masterful, uh, um, you know, master of the word in that sense, but it's because God's given me a Bible and his Holy Ghost and an unction. And I can show you, I could take this King James Bible and I can help you to show you how to, how to find that and how to show your situation is there. It's not, there are no temptations taken you but such as is common man Amen. your present situation is no different and you've got to work through it just like every other Christian has to work through it Amen. right Amen. that's what we have to do so I'm going to teach you how to do that today and show you some things about that right Amen. I've got I've got uh, some good news and some bad news here the bad news is I'll show you the terrible condition of what that's called about desertion so you can understand that. Joshua went through it. He said, man, the Lord's forsaken us. Israel's done. Why didn't you just leave us on the other side, God? We, we were fine over there. We could have just stayed over there. He started to sound like those other spies that didn't believe God. You know, I'll tell you what, you might think you're just a master of belief and you're a really strong Christian. And man, you've got so much belief. You let the right mixture, you let the right spiritual chemistry of mixture, the, the right poison to come. You let the right trial come and you'll be saying, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Because my unbelief is very strong. Sometimes my unbelief feels as if it will devour my belief. Right? That it'll take hold of it. That it'll crush it. You know, I'm too strong for that. Well, I hope you are strong enough not to have to see some things. But I'll tell you what. There is strength in weakness, and God shows that. When God brings you down to make you weak, then he actually makes you strong. Because you find your strength in Christ, and you find that your flesh is all weak. That's what you find. Amen. I know this from experience and from the scriptures, but I believe it's wise to take the scriptures we have before us and others that we have to learn and, and learn about this issue. So then if it does happen, you don't give in to Satan's attacks someday when he tries to convince you and talk you out of your faith. <laughs> Amen. When he tries to subvert you, discourage you, increase the, shoot fiery arrows of doubt at you. And when you're, because I'm going to tell you what, there ain't nobody, and I know I use that word ain't, and you, you, you teachers like that word, and I, it makes me use it even more. I just want you to know that. When, when I see you look over the glasses and you look at me like this, I'm like, mm-hmm, ain't, 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 ain't. All right? I don't know. I'm ornery. I ain't saying. But uh, anyway. But when we look at the scriptures and we see this, we see this great truth, right, that God has for us. We understand that when you're down, there's no one that will kick you like Satan. I mean, he'll, when you're at your lowest point <laughs> and you are just so distraught, and he'll send people to do it too, by the way, but he will kick you 
when you are down, and he will try to get the death blow. Remember Apollyon when he was after Christian, and he had, he, he had, he had uh, in Pilgrim's Progress, and he had taken him down, and he slashes him, and he slays him, and he's, he's weakened, and he's down. And man, that's when Satan comes in for the kill. He's, beasts smell blood, right? They smell blood. They track blood, and they go after it. You know, like that deer that one time that we tried to get Lee, and I tried, remember that? We looked all uh, late, right? Right. And but but the but the coyotes, I, I told Lee, I said, man, I don't want the coyotes to get this deer. And the coyote did get the deer, got the just bit the last half of the leg off. We just chopped it off and took it home anyway. But but anyway, but rightly, that's right. what rightly. So anyway, we, we did. But but you know what? The beasts, they smell blood. That's what Satan is. He's a beast. So he smells that fear, and he, and he feeds off of that fear and that he feeds off of that misunderstanding. So I want to clear some things up for you. So when we get to it, you, you'll be able to be like, okay, I, I kind of understand some of this. It makes sense to me. So first, let's talk about the reality of that spiritual desertion, desertion. that Joshua was deserted of the Lord. We cannot deny it in that sense. There's a sense that he was deserted. There is a sense that, that, that God will desert his children. Not a final forsaking or anything like that, but God will pull away his comfortable presence. So when we say desertion, we do not mean that you stop being a son of God, that God unsuns you. Okay, I, say, I use that word, and that's probably not good English either, but I've, <laughs> I've never been accused of using good English, except when I read from the King James Bible. Right, Brother Paul? Amen. That's right. But anyway, <clears throat> unsun, right? No, you're not going to stop being God's son. When the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. When he makes you a son, you're a son. Amen. Amen? You're adopted into the family of God. We believe that. Amen. Now, with that comes the responsibility that you have a father, though. And what it means to, to go through spiritual desertion is that God takes his comfortable presence away. Now, notice, I did not say he takes his presence away. I said he takes his comfortable presence away. There's a difference. There's a difference. Therefore, in verse number 12, Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed from among you. God said, my... My comfortable presence, I'm, I'm not going to be with you. You don't get rid of this. You're going to know what it means not to have that close fellowship with me. Right? What does the Bible tell us in the New Testament? We lose our, our fellowship with God when we sin, right? And that fellowship has to be restored. We don't lose our sonship, but we sure do lose our fellowship. Right? That's the same thing with spiritual desertion. It works the same way in that sense. It's a different degree of it, and it's, it's quite a bit deeper, I believe, in that, than that. It's very real and powerful when the Lord pulls back his comfortable presence from you. Joshua knew full well that something was wrong. Many times God, God's people, when they suffer that spiritual desertion, they know something is wrong. They just don't know what it is. They just feel empty. They feel without God's, God's power and strength. They feel destitute. Spiritual desertion is real, though. The, some of our thoughts concerning it are furthest from the truth, though. Now, some of the things that you'll deduce from going through spiritual desertion are wrong. <laughs> and I'll show you that in the scriptures as the questions that were asked. But it makes you ask questions, which is a good thing, actually. Spiritual desertion works well for the child of God. It really does. It actually turns to their to their uh, growing in grace and knowledge. It tests other graces as they go through it. It, it does. It, it really does. Judge, I'm going to give you some examples of this. I want you to turn to Judges chapter 16, verse number 20. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. Samson had no idea. He's like, I'm just going to shake myself off and go to spiritual war, right? 
Sometimes you'll be like, you know, I, I had that happen. I mean, as instantly as he's talking about that, I had that very, not the same thing that he had, but a very similar thing as far as he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. I had that very thing happen, right? Where God said, he pulled back his presence, his, his comfortable presence, and destitution and being distraught hit right away. That's what happened. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. But I love this next verse because it's the grace of God. Do you understand this? Right? How be it? The hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Do you see how close, how, how, right after that verse, how God puts that in there? Amen. That is the inspired word of God right there, right? That's what that is right there. Because right after that, why is that? Because that's the hope of the saint right there. Amen. Because that's the hope of restoration. Do you, know, do you understand what that is? That when I sin, when I'm away from God and I'm wrong with God, the very next verse, God says, what does he say? He said, how be it the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. God already begins the process of restoration after you've fallen. Amen. Amen. God already does. He already begins it. It, it is true that it's a most lamentable and, de and desperate situation. Trying and hard. And the reality of it cannot be denied. If a man that has truly experienced desertion to a high degree, if he tries to explain it to others, others may be tempted to say, well, the man must not be saved, or, or God is merciful, uh, but what's wrong with this guy? You know, why is he like this? But you notice that the Bible says that, how be it the hair of his head began to grow. God's showing that God wasn't done with Samson. Sam, by the way, that sh you, you ought to understand also that after his spiritual desertion, Samson's greatest victory came. Amen. His greatest victory was in death. And your greatest victory will be in death to yourself. When you continue to die to self, your greatest spiritual victories will come. And that's what happens with spiritual desertion because you, you, you learn to not trust in the arm of the flesh. You learn to not trust in yourself. Right? Then how could we forget about Psalm 22, which is another example. Turn there to Psalm 22. David, at David and his foreshadowing of Christ on the cross. Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and I and am not silent, but thou art holy, O that thou inhabitest the, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Right? Psalm 22. We find David under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. What is David doing? David is foreshadowing what Christ was going to do. Christ said the same thing on the cross. But Christ actually went through the real desertion. He was really deserted. That's why you and I can have the power through the comfortable presence of the Lord leaving us that God's mercy is there for us because Christ suffered the ultimate desertion for us. Amen. You see? And by the way, when you suffer those spiritual desertions and those things, it's God conforming you to the image of Christ. Amen. It's making you more like Christ. Amen? That's right. It is the fellowship of His sufferings. Then who can forget Psalm 77? Turn there, Psalm 77. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. We'll talk about some of these symptoms in a minute here. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever, and will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. 
That was Asaph, his song. How about another one? How about He-Man? Right? And not He-Man, the masters of the universe, for some of you that don't know your Bible. I mean, the He-Man of the scriptures here. Right? That to clarify, some of you think I'm talking about He-Man, some other kind of He-Man. Scott, you're wondering, weren't you? I see that look. That they put that in there? Right, and, and that He-Man also, his name was Prince Adam. So you see all the occultic stuff, like they did that on purpose? They do it to mock God. That's, what they, that's why they do those things. You mean, you mean, preacher, you actually believe there's a devil out there and that he'd actually do that? I mean, really? I mean, in cartoons even, he would do that? Especially in cartoons. <laughs> right. Psalm 88 Verse 1, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. We'll get to that in a second. I am as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness in the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. Thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah, thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, and I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Selah. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? See, these are just a number of examples of men that cried out in destitution. You know, they asked some pretty interesting questions. Yep. And maybe some of you have never been there before. Now me, in the middle of the night, in the dark and the deepest of night, I've been there before. And you know what? God led me to those psalms and said, here, here's your answer right here, right here. There you go. They're right there. There's your answer. Start reading. It's like, oh, well, that's interesting. You mean there were other people that thought God totally forsook them, that they were destitute, that they were distraught, that they cried out, God, is your mercy clean gone forever? Yeah. yeah. They questioned God. They questioned everything. Yeah. Sure. Well, not strong Christians. I mean, if you grow up in fundamentalism or you grow I mean, you've never seen anybody like that before. I mean, they're not like that. Those, those guys are all strong and they, they're all, the pastors are always smiling and everything's always going great. And I mean, right, exactly. I mean, there's no, right? Like you don't talk about stuff like that. Like you don't really preach on stuff like that. That's for like those Reformers Unonymous druggy classes and you send people there and they, they're the ones that have those problems, but not most people, right? Most people don't have those problems. And most people don't deal with, uh, you know, I, a pastor could never admit to you that, that he struggled with doubts and fears, doubts, assurance, his assurance is failing. Spurge, you know what Spurgeon said? The man that preached the gospel more than, more than any modern day preacher ever. He said, ah, these painful and stinging doubts. Well, no way. Like, no way, right? Like, that guy never went through that. Wrote dozens of books. Right. I mean, wrote thousands of, of sermons and books and, and everything else and preached the gospel and everything. Loved the Lord. Loved Christ and lifted Christ up more than any. Well, that's why he was under attack so much. I mean. We have an enemy. I mean, this is like real. Like you really have, you really have an enemy that hates you, and he adds to that spiritual desertion when, when, when men go through those, those different trials. But Spurgeon used to cry. He, he could, I mean, there's been times, well, anyway, we'll talk about that later. We'll keep going here. Number two, what are the symptoms of this? Let's talk about that. We've kind of read some of them just now. Fear. Fear is one of them. You ever been afraid? I mean, you ever been afraid when nobody's around? and you fear a lot of things, and fear seems to consume you, and it seems to fill your heart where with this darkness and blackness, 
fear that fear that is like the darkness that can be felt that you could if you could reach out and touch it you could grab the darkness you would grab that fear and feel it you could feel it it's so real it's so dark and dismal and de- depressing and discouraging and a thousand thoughts of fear run through your mind a thousand thoughts and not one of them is a good one they are all bent on bad They are all bent on darkness. They are all bent on despair. They are all bent on discouragement and destitution. Right? Kind of the opposite of your best life now, I guess, huh? I thought about buying the Smiley Joel Olstein cube so I could make fun of it, but that's the reason why. But anyway, I do do make fun of heretics. I do. I do mock them like Elijah mocked them on the mountain when he made fun of them. I do because, because and, and I do, to, and I have no, I pull no punches with false prophets and those that, that seek to deceive people out of, out of salvation. I, I don't, I don't make any, I, I don't make any uh, uh, promises that I will not totally, absolutely pound them into the dirt scripturally with it and teach them how bad they are and how much they're leading people to hell. And when, I go to, when we go to these events, we preach against them and we don't pull any punches. And we preach right actually to them when we're at those events because they're leading men to hell. And there's nothing worse than somebody that leads somebody to hell. Amen. There's, like last night, Aaron was over there across the street handing out gospel tracts and some drunk pastor walked up to him and he is like, I'm a pastor. And he's like, and he's like, you're doing it wrong. And, uh, and he just came in, and he was like getting in there. And he's going like this. I walk, Giannis saw it, so I walk over there, and he's going like this. To, when I, by the time I get over, the guy shakes my hand. He grips my hand really tight. He's like, oh, you're a Pharisee. And then, he's like, then he goes like to Aaron, we'll see you, buddy. Yeah. And he's like hitting Aaron really hard. I'm like, <laughs> they just, they just they want to put their hands on you. They have that spirit, and they're really angry, and they want yeah. to like, like that one guy. See that GoPro right there? I yeah, just want to, yeah. And he took my GoPro off, and he ripped it off, and he threw it, and he was a pastor. He's like, "Buddy, I was worse than these guys at the heavy metal concert, right?" So we've seen, so we don't pull any punches with those false prophets. We preach against them, right? We warn people about them. We have to. That's our duty. Amen. It's our duty. But anyway, back to this fear, right? Fear. He said here, uh, uh, he said here, and I think it was uh, Psalm 77, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. He literally felt like he was in hell. There's so much fear. There can be a child of God can go through such destitution in that sense and such discouragement that he can think that he's not a child of God and that, he's, that, that he feels as if he's in hell. It's very possible for a child of God to go through that. It's very possible for a child of God to have that much doubt, that much fear, that much discouragement, that much destitution. Very possible for that to happen. In fact, I can show you some right here. See, all through the Psalms. You see them? They're right there. See, God put that in that book for you. God let those men go through that for you. So you could be ben- so they could be benefited and you could be benefited by what they go through. He said, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. He's saying, Lord, you're treating me like I'm, I'm, I'm one of them that are going to hell. I am as a man that hath no strength. I said, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I, I've been there. I've been there where I had absolutely no strength. Soul troubles feel as if they will consume you and they will kill you. It feels like hell on earth. He said in another verse, he said, free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. He said God had laid him down in the lowest of the darkest of darkness. That's what he felt like. That's where he felt like he was in hell. He said, thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Another verse, he says, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. 
boy, I know what that's like. I'm telling you, I've been there before, friend, where your soul re absolutely refuses any comfort. Whatever, it cannot attribute the comforts of the scriptures. It, can, it only sees the wrath of God in the scriptures. It only sees the pain and the suffering. It only sees the, the, the negativity or the bad things. It cannot apply the good things to your heart. The soul refuses to be comforted no matter what. It refuses it. It's, it's hard to explain, but he's explaining, and it's the scripture. So you, you, don't, you may not believe what I say, but you can believe what God says. Amen. You can believe what God says right there because it's right there. Right? And that's just plain English. That's not even my, like one guy said last night. That's just your interpretation. No, I didn't interpret anything. I just read it to you. I didn't even interpret that to you. I just read it to you. He said it right there. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I didn't interpret that to you. I just read it to you. You can interpret that very, that's very plain. See, you don't have to do that with the, with the plain King James English right there. It's just right there. It's right there. It's, it's right there. It's very simple, very simple. Right there. Your soul refuses all comfort. It cannot receive it, but it rejects any hope of comfort. The, you know, he, he says the, the very remembrance of God troubles the soul. He said, I remembered God and was troubled. Boy, that's something. I'll tell you, when you go through that, I, I, it, it, it's so scary of a thought that just thinking about God and thinking about the things that troubles your soul. You, you begin to be completely troubled and in, and in, and in an absolute uh, bind of fear and darkness and discouragement. And, and just the very thought of God troubles you. When the thought of God used to bring such joy and comfort to your heart and your soul, but now it brings such terrible pain and discomfort and grief. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed and in destitution. Yeah. Yep. So we say, I've never been through that before. What is this guy talking about? Well, what he's talking about right here is the same thing I'm talking about. I'm just reading you what he said, right? Under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost right there. That's all that. That's just good Bible. Amen. I got a lot of verses in here. You'll always think that death is but a step away from you and that any time you will die and not live out your days. The deserted man feels as if God's wrath and not his blessing is upon him. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in darkness in the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. And thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. And let me tell you something, friend, how low a Christian man or woman can really go in the deeps. In the darkest of night, in the depths of soul trouble. How high God's children can go in soul heights and how low they can go in soul depths. It's amazing the, the, the difference of how far they can go. How high they can rise and how, fall, how far they can crash down. Joshua has the greatest victory, then he has the most crushing defeat. He felt as if God was his enemy and not his friend, that God was against him and not for him. All spiritual strength seems to be gone. I am as a man that hath no strength. Oh, I know what that's like. The questions start to begin to be asked. You start to ask questions in your, in your heart and to God even, and you start to pray, and, and which is what God wants you to do, which we'll talk about more about next week. But you'll start to ask questions, right? Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? Good question to ask. Amen? You know, when you start asking God questions, that's, why, that's when you're on the right path. <laughs> When you start asking those questions of God, then, then, then you're going places. You're moving through some things. Because that's what you have to do. You've got to ask God some questions. Because God's going to ask you some questions, right? Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? Why, Lord? Why are you allowing this to happen? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up while I suffer thy terrors. I am distracted. Oh, I understand that. 
can't focus on anything, completely distracted by everything. Can, no, no, no focus in your mind and your heart. You're just, you're, your mind is everywhere in a thousand different places in one time. No, no, no steady thoughts going through your mind. No steady thoughts going through the way it's supposed to be, but everywhere, just scatterbrained everywhere, completely. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. You know, terror was stricken in his heart. And God does strike that terror in the heart of his own children when his comfortable presence is denied them. By the way, this is a strong defense for eternal security because God doesn't need to, uh, to uh, get rid of his children. He doesn't need to adopt them out to somebody else. He doesn't need to abandon them. God doesn't abandon his children. He is well able to make his erring child beg for his presence and power. He is well able. You know, God doesn't have to be like, well, no, nope, you're, you're going to lose your salvation. You're no, that's not. That's like, that's like saying you have to, your son right here, your child, well, I can't make him mine, so I can't make him obey me, so therefore I'm going to give him to somebody who can. That's not how God works. See, God's a perfect parent. God knows how, God will make you beg for his presence. You'll beg for his help. You'll absolutely beg for it. Amen. You'll want it more than anything. You'll, you'll esteem it more than your necessary food. That's how it'll work. God makes it work that way. Amen. Aren't you glad God's in charge of salvation this morning? Yeah, yeah, Aren't you on. glad that it's God yep. that's in charge of that and not us? We're so weak and feeble, right? All these guys thinking they're tough and strong and they can, you know, they're, they're, they're going to go through all this. No, it's God that brings you through everything. It's God that, that, that brings you through. It's God's grace that does it. God knows how to deal with his own children. You know, he may even take sleep from you. Sleep may be taken from the child of God. God holds his eyes open. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. Yep. He allows the child of God to be so troubled that he cannot speak. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Oh, I know what that's like. I've been there before. I've been so troubled and my heart so melted in me due to fear and confusion and lack of comfort and assurances from the Lord that I could not get words to come out of my mouth. I remember sitting in this very room with my dad. I've told you that story before. But I remember sitting in an afternoon in this room with my dad, and I could not. And I was going through one of the most fiercest and awful, discouraging trials of my life. Awful, terrible, evil. And I remember sitting there, and my dad looked at me and he said, Well, I, I think you should pray. And I, I could barely get it out of my mouth. I said, I can't. I can't. I, I, I couldn't even talk. I, I couldn't. I couldn't. And he put his arm around me and he prayed for me. And when he prayed for me, God began to melt my heart and give me and loosen my tongue and give me the ability to be able to pray. I know what it's like to be there. I know what it's like to be in that place. I know what it's like to be that dark and that destitute and that discouraged and that down and that beaten up and that kicked. I know what it's like to be there. I remember Brother Andrew another time, right? I remember that happened another time with Brother Andrew. I couldn't even preach. I was supposed to get up and preach. I, I couldn't preach. I walked in that office right there and... And I got on the floor, and we were going to pray. And I got on the floor, and Brother Andrew came in there with me. And he got on the floor with me, and we were praying. And I, I really couldn't say much. I couldn't. He had to pray. And then, then, then I think I was able to pray afterwards. And then you were all praying for me out here, right? 
So I, I know what it's like to be there. I know what it's like to go through that. I know what it's like for God to humble you and to bring you through things and to allow you to go through that. And I'm not ashamed of what God did for me. And I'm not ashamed of being in that position. I'm not ashamed of being melted before you. I'm not ashamed to tell you that I've been through spiritual depression. I've been through depression. I've been through anxiety. I've been through those mental health things. I've had the Lord take me to the heights and I've had the Lord take me through the depths. I've had the Lord walk me through that valley of the shadow of death and that darkness. And I've been out on the other side and I know what it's like to be in both of them. And I know what it means to go through those things and how God does it for his glory. And he does it to strengthen his children. He does it so you'll help others with it. Amen. I understand that's part of the reason why God allowed me to go through it. Because I needed, there was a side of compassion that was missing from me. And I needed it. And God touched me with it. So I'd have it. And it's a gift of God. It really is. It's a gift. It really is. That's right. It's a gift. And if you don't have it, you'll get it if you're God's. He'll give it to you. Especially if you need to meet it out to others. You're going to get it. <laughs> Amen. If you're not compassionate yet, if you're cold-hearted when it comes to things, like, God's going to melt your heart. If you're his child, God's going to use, he's going to use a series of trials to melt you because you're too big for your britches and you think you're, you think you're hot stuff and God's going to show you you ain't so hot. Amen. He's going to show you, you, you think you got it all figured out, right? Well, you're going, to, you're going to find out you don't have it all figured out, and God's going to show you. Why? He's going to take away the things and the situations and everything that you're comfortable with, and he's going to kind of shake that up a bit to test your faith and to test your faithfulness to him. Because when God's going to do something with somebody or he's going to give something to somebody, he always puts them through something first. And you know the reason he does it? So they're not proud about it after he does it for them. They walk in humility, and they don't think they've done it themselves. And you know what? Let me tell you something. The reason why you don't have what you want yet is because you haven't come to the end of yourself yet, and God knows that. And as soon as you come to the end of yourself, which is not for you to choose, it's for God to show you. God will show you when you've come to the end of yourself in that situation. He'll show you. And when you've come to the end of yourself in that situation, then you'll see the light. It'll shine. It'll shine. You'll see it. It'll be there. Amen. Joshua 7, 10, and the Lord said to Joshua, get thee up, wherefore liest upon thy face. You know, Joshua felt surrounded by all his enemies so that, that they would destroy him. He began to doubt God's goodness to him as if God played some dirty trick on him. I know what that's like. I know about feeling that way and thinking that about God, that, oh, God, you know, God called you to the ministry, did this, and then all of a sudden you're having all these doubts and fears and this, <laughs> this spiritual desertion and going through depression, have all these things, and God just abandoned you and he's done with you. Just tell you, oh, it wasn't real in the first place. This is the, really the way it is. That's what Joshua was tempted to believe, right? That's what Joshua was tempted to believe. You're tempted to believe that too when you go through things like that. That's... You're tempted to believe that too. Why? Because it's such as is common to man. That's why. Other men did the same. Look at Psalm 77 and verse 7. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promises fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? You know, when a man's in this condition or a woman's in this condition, they'll, feel, they'll definitely run the gauntlet of emotions. They'll think God has changed his mind, that he's not merciful any longer, and that God's done with them. God's forgotten to be gracious. He's not good. God changed his nature. He's no longer who he said he was, right? They think that they will not endure, that God will desert them, that they will not make it. He will cry with David, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See, these symptoms are very real symptoms that a child of God, a child of light walking in darkness may go through. Isaiah 50, verse number 10, Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? That's what happened to him. He's a child of God. Child of light walking in darkness and it seemed to have no light. Could you really be that destitute? Could it really get that dark? Could, it, could you really get that down? Yes. 
Yes. So what are the causes of this condition? Well, I would say mostly sin. Mostly sin. Now, God does it for many reasons. He'll chasten us for many reasons, but mostly sin. Sin is the cause of all the woes and sorrow in this world. Like I told people last night, they said, why does God allow this and this and this? I said, that's sin. None of that was in this world till sin. Right? Right. Sin. Sin is the cause. Sin brings death. It brought death in, and it constantly worked death in our flesh. Sin. Many times, though, it is rarely the sin that you may be accused of, or some may think that it is. Many times, it's not even anything near that. That God's dealing with you. Somebody has a thought they think about you. Oh, that's probably why God's doing that because of you. You did this and because of that. Right? No. Rarely it is that. It's something that God's dealing with you about. Right? Uh, Brother Dave and I talked about that, right? We said that, you know, the, the, the lost world can accuse us of so many things. And they're wrong about it, but then God uses that for us to think about things. Right. And then we start thinking and saying, you know what? They're not right about that, but man, God just pricked my heart that I shouldn't be, I shouldn't have done this. Right. I shouldn't have responded this way. I shouldn't have acted this way. Right. So no, they're, it's the furthest from the truth what they said, but you know what? God dealt with me. God knew what my sin was. Amen. Right? It's like Samson. He wist not that the Lord had departed from him. He had no clue until it came upon him. But his sin was tempting God. Among fornication and other sins, he tempted the Lord. He was presumptuous. Israel had sin, right? Joshua 7, 11, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. You know, that's you and I get into trouble when we sin. Let's just, I mean, is that, that's very plain. Boy, that's not, that's not theologically deep preacher. It doesn't have to be. You and I wouldn't get it if it was. This makes it really easy. Sin. Amen. Sin. And probably, again, not the sin you think. It's rarely that. It's, ra it's rarely something that you think it is simple like, oh, well, this, no. With something like spiritual desertion, it is something deep about you as a person. Something that God wants to change about you. Right. Do you understand? No, you may not, but you will someday. <laughs> I do. I get it because I've been through it. But something about you God wants to change. Something major that's a part of your Christianity uh, or a part of your life that it needs to be done. And it can. God says, no, nope, I'm done with that. You're not going to be that way anymore. And I'm going to touch you, and I'm going to prick you, and you're never going to be that way again. Like Jacob when he touched the hollow of his thigh, right? Yeah. Jacob's never, never walked the same again, did he? Well, after you go through that spiritual desertion, after God touches you and he chastens you and he deals with you on that, you'll, you're never going to do that again. Mm-mm. You will never be that way again. God will remove, he will no longer allow that to have any semblance of victory over you. You will hate it, you will detest it, and you will fight it. That's how it works. That's how it works. Psalm 77, verse 6, I called to remember it's my song in the night. I communed with mine own heart and my spirit made diligent search. What What happens? Diligent search, right? You start to commune with your own heart. I remember doing this. I had, I, man, I had everybody and their brother and maybe even their mother and probably their moms accuse me of everything in the world. I mean, they probably linked me to JFK's assassination somehow. And it all happened within a week. But anyway, I, I had all that coming down and pretty much everything they said was garbage. It wasn't even true. I mean, they made two-hour, three-hour videos about me, epic movies and adventures about me. 
And uh, there's still those videos out there somewhere floating around, but I'm still here too, serving God, doing the same thing I've always done by the grace of Almighty God. So they can have their videos and I'll keep doing God's work. Amen? Because we have an unction from the Holy One. That's, that's, that's how that works. But anyway, here's the thing. Uh, they, they did all that, but that's not, God says, no, I, I don't care about anything they said about you. Like, I don't, that doesn't matter. I'm going to do, I remember exactly where I was at. And I was, I was, re, it was funny because I was reading that book by Timothy Rogers. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah, spiritual melancholy. Yeah, I was reading that book and something in it he said the Lord used. And it just, it triggered my mind and my heart. And he said, you know what? God's going to bring you back to the very place and the very thing that he was angry with you over. And he's going to show you what you did. And I'm telling you what, it was like, it was like a punch from heaven. Whoa, took me straight back. You know how, you know how Ezekiel was lifted up by the hair? Here, come here, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> let, me throw you, let me toss you in the air a bit. Here you go. God literally did that to me in my mind. He just went, here you go. <laughs> Threw him up there. Go on back there. Right there. Right to the spot. And he took me right to that place. And he said, this is where you gave into fear. This is where you trusted the arm of flesh and you did not trust me. You did not seek me. You didn't seek me with all your heart. You detoured from me. You got off the path. You followed something else and you are going to suffer for it. And this is why you did suffer for it. And this is what you did. And this is the exact time you did it. And this is where you angered me. And this is why I allowed this to happen. Right there. I mean, pinpointed like an arrow. Right to the, and, I, and God showed me it all right there. It just all came to my remembrance right there. There it is. Oh, boy. Because then I started to look back and I saw this path. And it went like this. Here's the, the narrow way, and I went. Amen. Oh. Ouch. And then a series of domino effects happened because of that right there. Amen. And God said that faint fateful van ride that night and all that stuff that happened to you and it wasn't that point but that was the ramifications of what was done before that that wasn't that that was just that was just the comeuppance <laughs> that's all that was that was just the effects of where you made your mistake before where you sinned against me and nobody else knew it but it was trusting in the arm of flesh and God knew it and that's why God None of them knew it. Nobody else knew it. But God knew it. He said, you trusted in flesh. You didn't trust me. You veered off. You followed something else other than me. And that's when you left the simplicity. And one of the, it, what's funny about that, I didn't even come to that conclusion when I came back that January uh, at the end of the month, but I preached a message called Seduced from Simplicity. And that's what happened. So diligent search has to be made. You know, uh, about, about what that is or why, especially for a pastor, when you trust in the arm of flesh and you don't, you don't trust the Lord, God's going to show you that that's going to lead to destruction. It also leads to a series of betrayals that the Lord allows for a reason. To show you, you don't trust in the arm of flesh. You trust me. That's right. That's right. God showed me. Very clearly, and God will show you too. And that yours may be a totally different situation, a totally different circumstances, everything else. It will be. It won't all be the same because our lives are not the same. But there'll be something. Psalm 139, verse number 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 
You know, there's not many things that God hates more than when he shows his children, especially as pastors, his power and his care for them and his nurture for them. And he takes care of them and they turn to the arm of flesh. God showed me this is the reason. This is what I'm going to teach you. And how much sorrow and grief it brought to my heart along the way. And such afflictions of soul and mind. And depression on top of that. But I would say to you, keep a short sin account. Don't heap up sin. God will deal with his children's sin. God will deal with your self-reliance and your trusting in gifts and not the giver. You're focusing on your sanctification and not Christ's justification. You should remember that... Christ, Christ is the believer's source of justification and sanctification. But if we neglect to properly remember the person and the work of Christ, God will bring us back to the foot of the cross. He will bring us back to that simplicity in Christ and make us look at that dying lamb. He will take us to the grave and show us the empty tomb. He will make us look at all power that is given to Christ in heaven and earth. That he is before all things and by him all things consist. That desertion is a form of chastening. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that. We're almost finished here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we have given them reverence. We have gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. You know what? Some of you are going through some things right now, right? You're going through some things right now, and they're, they seem to be hot trials, right? And they're hard, and, 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 and the Lord's allowing you to go through them. But there's a reason. It's for your profit. It's for your spiritual profit. You think it's not. You think that if God gave you what you wanted right now, that would be for your good but you are arguing with God's providence. You are telling God that he can father you better, or you can father better than he can, that you know more than he does. Because these trials that I'm going through, I just don't deserve them. Some other loser deserves them. That's not, as, that's not as organized as me. Some other loser deserves them that doesn't have it all together like I do. Right? Some other loser deserves, I mean, I have all my ducks in a row. I have everything going the right way. I mean, I'm doing things, you know, right. I mean, give that to somebody else, right? But not me. I shouldn't go through that. Not, I mean, I, I shouldn't. Those lessons are for somebody else. Lord, I don't need these trials. Luke needs these trials. Give them to Luke. Lord, I think this trial will be better suited for Andrew, not me. Please, Lord, dump this trial on Andrew. Right? You, right? That sound about right? You think that the trials that you have are not fitted for you. Well, you do God a great disservice by thinking that. Because God uniquely fitted those trials for you. Specifically for you. Like, you know... Yeah, that's why it hurts. You know, this morning I was looking at, uh, you know, my routine, like Brother Paul said, you know, you don't have your routine down yet, do you? I was like, no, I don't. And he knew, he knows that because it's like when you go someplace, I mean, it's like everything's like, I don't know where anything's at. We're still trying to figure out where, I don't even know what's in my house yet. I don't even know, I don't even, I don't even know half of what's on my property. I don't know any of it. I just, I'm just trying to live there, um, sort of. I just sleep there, really. I'm just trying to figure it out. I don't, I don't know where anything's at. But anyway, the point is that, I, I don't have my routine down, and, and I don't know what the best thing, way is to go, but God does. God knows. And sometimes you and I can think we got it all down, we got it all figured out better than God. Yep. That, that what God has given you for a trial, you don't need. 
Well, you're saying God doesn't know how to father you then. Oh, I think it's absolutely what you need. Because God says it. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So the trial that you're going through right now is for you to be a partaker of his holiness. Amen. That is a tough job. Right? You take part. Partaker of his holiness. That's what God wants to do. And here's how you feel about it. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. This stinks. <laughs> right? That's what you think. This stinks. But that's, that's not a sin for you to think that because it says it's not, it isn't joyous. I mean, you're not, you're not going to be happy about it and skipping around and jumping around about it and saying, hey, this is great. I love it. Beat me some more. <laughs> right? Right. No, it says, now, no chasing for the present seemeth, seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Did you know that grief is not always bad? You think it is. You've been taught that, oh, stop crying. Get them to stop crying right away. Get them to stop being that way right away because, you know, that grief is, no, grief is not, al is not always bad. Grief needs an outlet. It needs to be let out. When it's not let out, that's when, ver when a lot of bad things happen. Right? There's people that tell their children that they can't cry. Now, I tell my kids, you're not going to scream, but you can cry. But you, you're not going to scream because that's not controlling your emotions at all. That's, that's, that's letting your things, but, but they should cry. Amen. Right? Yep. Why? Because that's normal. That's a normal, that's, a, that, that's, that's how God made you. He made you. Right? He made you to cry. So you want them to cry. Right? Like that. <laughs> that's right. Perfecting praise. But all grief is not bad, right? But, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. What does it do? It yieldeth. What's that word yield mean, Lee, to yield something when you're a farmer? What does it mean? Production. Increase. Right. So it yieldeth, right, something. There's a yield, right, that it comes, right? Yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's what it does. I can say that through all of the things that the Lord allowed me to go through with that chastening of the Lord, that desertion and those other things, that it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. God taught me. And some of us are very stubborn and we have to be whipped all the way to heaven. Some of us have to be spanked all the way to heaven. Because we're stubborn. Right? Not you. That's for everybody else. <laughs> the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You are exercised thereby when you go through that. God will not let his people live in known sin and not repent of it. But you know what? If you're here today and you're not saved, I'm here to tell you that Spiritual desertion is, is, is not the half of it. It is complete desertion of God that you will go through in that sense. And you will, you, will, you will suffer the full wrath of God in the lake of fire for all of eternity if you're without Christ. You see, those, that suffer some, those of his children that suffer some of his comfortable presence to be departed, we believe it is the hell of hells. And by the way, many preachers have described it when they've gone through that spiritual desertion of those things, and I've described it that way too. You literally feel like you're abandoned and you're in hell. God gives you that. God allows you to go through that and feel that desperation and that discouragement and that destitution, Right? But if you're lost and you've never come to Christ, if you've never been born again, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you've never turned to Jesus and called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, 
then you will suffer worse than that in the lake of fire for all of eternity. That judgment is upon you. It presses on your soul daily. And there will be a day when you will die. Or there could be a day when you turn so dark against the truth that you want nothing to do with it. That's why we don't play games with God. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Amen? Kiss the son, the son of God, lest he be angry. Amen? Come to that merciful God to forgive your sins. Will you not come to Christ who died on the cross for your sins? How he was buried and he rose again. Will you not turn to the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world? What are you waiting for? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Turn to Christ and he will pardon your sin. Do you believe that he is able to do this? For you that are God's children, next week we'll look at the cure for that desertion. How, how these men got through it, how they dealt with it, uh, and how the scriptures illustrate and show us how to deal with those things. We'll walk step by step. Here's a hint. Read the same verses in the chapters of 77, 88, uh, 22, and some of those others. Wow, I wonder if there's a number system there. I haven't looked at that yet, but maybe I will. Um, but, but take a look at that. Read some of those. But we'll go through them step by step next week because I want to help you with that. Because you may say, I'm not in that position now. Well, you may not be, but file it away because someday you may be. Yeah, amen. And you'll need to be strengthened. And God's Word has such power to strengthen the soul. In the depths of darkness, He shines His light. Father in heaven, Lord, thank You. Thank You for the Scriptures. I pray, Lord, if there be any not saved, that they'd come to know Christ, who is to know life everlasting. Thank You for Jesus. Thank You for salvation. Praise Your holy name for all of Your teaching, all of Your chastening of us, Lord your loving care and kindness to us, your fatherly love to us, your brotherly love in Christ to us, and the Holy Ghost of God to indwell us. Our hearts are full of joy of the Holy Ghost, and we're thankful for all that you do. Dear God, work in us a mighty work. In Jesus' holy name we pray and ask it. Amen.